All right, I was looking at the calendar, and I thought we might have to put the answer Jesus off even longer than we have. But it's you know, several weeks away, isn't it? In the latest calendar. I think it's like almost the end of February. Yeah, I think you got March. Wait, March 15th? March 15th? Yeah, oh yeah. We got a long time on that. Okay. Uh, when you get your email to your address and then going back to small Okay. So I'm I'm feeling like we haven't uh, covered that in Jesus well enough for you to have it till March. And uh, if we can cover this other stuff on Doctrine today, I think that's a much easier project. But let's kind of set up for that. And then I'm going to try to take some time today to talk about uh, about where I think we've still got some place to go on uh, the next Jesus. So, the subject for today is what's a good subject for your paper? Right now, I'm thinking about asking you to have an introductory section that you wouldn't necessarily present in a lesson at church, say, showing your general understanding of what doctrine is and how you determine what are important doctrines. And then probably come up with a lesson. I had one graduate teacher who always, I mean, he was a real scholar, um, real life, but, and he, uh, he said, oh, y'all write sermons, you know, instead of writing uh, research papers. He said, why don't you do something you're going to use, because we're all ministers. And as much as I can, I want to do that, but I didn't create the whole of that. And uh, some of it's going to be uh, technical. But I want you for this one to think of a time that you would be able to uh, deliver maybe an adult or a teenager's class, or if you were to write material for someone else to teach, a session on a doctrine that you've got. You kind of see what that document's supposed to be now, I'll give you some specifics. So, as we look at it, I want us to think more about how do you decide what doctrines to address, and I have several ways of looking at it. All right, which courses do you remember taking at Faulkner that were classified as doctrine courses? Minor problems. Nope. Uh, Ephesians, um, Bible, those things are No, a whole course that you think was subject to a doctrine. The older great things required that you take a doctrinal course in all the other things. I would say the class of Dr. Bach and apologetics. Apologetics, yes. Yeah. Oh, Christian evidence. That's right. Yeah. That's a doctrinal yeah. course. And the others like that that you took? A subject. I think you're like a of redemption. King of redemption is one. I didn't yeah. take that. You didn't take that. <laughs> oh, I know there is. Okay, well, let's look at it this way. I pulled up old catalogs. <clears throat> On the left, plus the two on the right that will come to separately, those have in the past been listed as doctrinal courses. As you know, the new, uh, maybe not much, which I'll finish them up, but the new, doc, the new Bible majors degree plan no longer have a category called doctrine. They just show up under electives. But the book used to list all those on the left as doctrinal, plus one called biblical interpretation that everybody does have to take that is um, also classified as doctrine. And then there was one called Great Doctrines of the Bible, which are God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, inspiration of scripture, sin, salvation, and the church. Um, those are the topics we've been talking about. That those are primary doctrines that you want to teach. Now on the left, if you were told we need to go back and, and redo it so that everybody has to take Three doctrinal courses. And we want our alumni to tell us which ones should we uh, should we include on the list. Can you think of one or two on that list that you would, that you would want offered if, if you were a new student on the left hand list? Good looking back in the church. Okay. Anybody else? You might have a fancy word for doctrine of the church. Ecclesiology. Yeah. What else? Christian evidence. Christian evidence, which is apologetics. What else? 
particular issues in the church? Yeah, we saw the way they finally, a couple of years ago, they combined with contemporary religious thought. There was hardly a difference between the two systems. Right. But that would be uh, that would be an ongoing. What are people talking about now? Mm -hmm. What about? Uh, I think that it would be tough for me to do a whole semester on inspiration and authority of scripture. Mm -hmm. I think I could go a month, but I don't know about three. Ah, Christianity and doing it. Boy, that's a big one. Anything else up there that you would definitely want to include? Or turn around. What would you drop? If you only have three or four of them, is there anything up there you would just say, I, I guess it's the best one that one? Well, definitely, uh, like you just mentioned, inspiration, authority of the Bible, because it's a limb. That's not a whole force in that. Yeah, exactly. I, I would try to do this. I would want to know anything about it. You know, both of us, and we all are Bible believing people, we say if you just say what the Bible says, the other will fall away on its own. And I think that's kind of your philosophy. Yeah. Well, oh, they got a nice letter on the Bible. It must be a fault. It must be a splinter group that's not following the Bible. Anything else? How about uh, ethics? I don't know if I would call that a doctrinal course or not, but we're going to get into a discussion of that. I could do without last things, particularly if they have the option of choosing Revelation and Daniel or something like that. Yeah. Oh, the Gospels, with those little bits in there. But I think the first one, if you could divide it in half, I won't talk about the Bible, but I won't talk about my God. Yeah, but I like to call it a doctrinal course. Uh, I think it was put there, I asked sometimes, because the idea is that archaeology verifies the historicity of the Bible. Yeah. No, I got but it really, I think it's just a tool for understanding the Bible better. Uh, it's a good course, but I don't know if I would call it doctrine. Now, over here, have you all taken a course called Bible, Biblical Interpretation? You should have. A study of the principles of Biblical Interpretation, techniques and methods of Bible study, strong emphasis on how to establish Biblical authority. Do you remember learning all that? Okay. Uh, what kind of techniques? How much did you cover in techniques? You probably had different teachers at different times. But did they talk about exegesis in that class? Yes. yes. Did they make you do an exegesis? Yes. Okay, so you have you faced up to this before. And that was different than writing a sermon, right? Yes. And there are other techniques for homiletics, making a sermon out of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, on interpretation, I, boy, that'd be a course in itself, which is the name of the course, by the way. Uh, what kinds of principles of interpretation did it teach you? Do you remember? Did they say, it means what it says, it says what it means, let's move on? Yeah. They did. Yeah. I think. Follow how that might have been said. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, they broke it down. Um, they want to, like what you were saying, look at from other angles um, on you know, particular sayings and meanings mm -hmm. and try to, you know, just because they said it then, so that doesn't necessarily mean that might be the same thought as of now. But first, find out what it meant for them. Exactly. So you'll have a reason to then make a, uh, an intelligent decision. Well, yeah, it's about family, but we still have families that might apply. Mm -hmm. um, but then there might be some reason that this was a unique situation in the congregation. It's a, but you got to say this and that, and that's a principle of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, did they in that class emphasize biblical authority? And what is the difference in inspiration and authority? I think that we put them together because we believe if it's inspired as we define it inspired, it's a dark age, it came from God. It wasn't two different questions. Some people believe God inspired it at the time, but it may not be a far table today. We're Bible believing people. We're going to say, if you find the meaning and you put it in historical context, which may be the same today, it's a dark table. All right? Is that what you feel? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Right. 
So we do have a course in biblical interpretation, which should lead to establishing doctrine as true doctrine. And any one of those at the bottom, don't you think any one of those could be a whole force? The nature of God. The nature of Christ. I've wanted sometimes to teach Sunday school talk, class called specifics about Christ outside the four Gospels, as well as those Gospels. But much of what we believe about Christ comes from the Epistles, particularly the longer ones. I remember very well that semester I had the three Muslims and one of them talked to me a lot. I realized that I had a for life apart. There wasn't a lot about grace and forgiveness and salvation through Christ. That's interpreted after Christ goes back to heaven. So, so you see what I'm saying? So Christology has to be more than just a study of the Gospels. I do think, I don't I said inspiration, but um, we already covered that. That's probably not a whole semester. The doctrine of sin. We don't need that anymore because people won't listen to us. Is that right? <laughs> I think that was predicted in the Bible. But I don't think I'd want to be in proof it was predicted. And salvation. You know, it's an elephant in the room that we don't all agree exactly with what the Bible requires for salvation. We all agree that it depends on God. And God is what he does to forgive us. We don't all agree on what the scripture says to tell people to be saved. But it is each of us is in a position to, to be responsible. If we're going to try to speak for God, to know what we think the Bible says. And the hardest thing for all of us, I think, is to be sure that you're drawing it just from the Bible and not this is what I've always believed or this is what I said to believe. One of those is a good standard. And I've told this so many times, I know some of you have heard it in other times. But I remember very well a, a, a class I had in graduate school that kind of dealt with biblical interpretation. And I thought, you know, try to echo what they taught in the class. We have to put away our tinted glasses and see just what does it say. And I can see in red where, where Dr. Allen wrote in my margin, can we ever really do that? Do you understand why that's an important question? I think we need to admit that we see things already shaded in meaning. And then step back to say, is it valid or not? It's better to recognize that we already have shaded the meaning. But is that what I've always done? Yeah, we've always believed that. Well, and that's the only reason I believe it, because we've always believed it. And then I, th I think that we will always be inclined to go what we want, back to what we've always believed. But most of us have learned something, you know. We always said that it isn't exactly what the Bible says in that book. And that's the challenge. So, on salvation and the church, I, I've always grown up, back to what I was saying, believing the church is very simple and exists on the congregation level. And I think that there are many groups that believe that, and more and more people who don't want to be in a group are believing that. So, that much on what was in the curriculum. Now, sorry to went off the screen, but what do we call doctrine? These two passages parallel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Remember we mentioned that there are weightier matters, there are less weighty matters? Which was a revelation to me when somebody pointed it out to me. It's been there in my Bible all along. But what are the way to your matters? Justice and mercy, and depending on your translation, faith or faithfulness. And then notice he says, These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. I don't know which way to take the front end of that last sentence, but he's saying, It's not bad that you want to be meticulous in your tithing. But it's ridiculous if you're neglecting justice and mercy and faithfulness. Isn't that his point? So, 
to apply the teaching of Jesus, you need to come up with what are the way your matters. Now, this is my guess to say. He's told you, old man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? You see how similar those are, though. And how are they different from that previous slide of doctrines that we should all teach? Like, but how can you do that unless you believe at least some of that previous slide? Well, but you got all of this, and then you've got this. I think they're different. Yeah, but how can you walk? How can you say he has told you, old man, what is good? And mm-hmm. believe in the scriptures. Right? Yeah. I mean, you got to believe, you know, like this guy in the essential the the doctrine of the mm-hmm. Supreme Court, one, he gives you 14 things. If you wrap your arms around those 14 things, yeah, you can come back and do that. He talks about crisis, you know, God's, God's, uh, he talks about the necessary of God's grace, necessary of faith, Christ the Son and death, Christ body resurrection, Christ, uh, Christ body ascension, Christ being presented as high priest, and uh, I mean, Christ being presented as a high priest, Christ second coming. Virgin birth, my sinlessness, my deity. If you can wrap your hands around those 14 things that he lives in that paragraph, then you can believe, if you believe all of that, and you research all that, and you believe all that, then you can do that. I think it has to go one step beyond what you just said, but I that's completely true, and that is to say, and you believe you should be like Jesus. You know, none of those are commanding you. But if you believe Christ is the source of your being, mm-hmm. if, he's, if he's everything, if he's, if he's everything, I mean, he's the reason why, I mean, he died for you, and he, and then, then now, okay, then now, oh man, then, then, oh man, I can do what is different. You know, well, why doesn't the Lord require me to do justice, to love God, and to walk humbly with your God? Let me throw out an alternative. It's not actually opposed to what you're saying, but alongside it. I can picture, particularly church leaders, discussing the doctrines, all those, that is wonderful statement of Christology, all those statements. Yeah. And still, nobody's teaching that congregation that they are being unjust to the needy, unkind to the poor and their arrogance and their Christianity. They might not have taught anybody to be merciful. They might not have taught them to be faithful or turn around to full of faith. And you see how those are different? The same thing is if you have faith, then you have to show it. I agree with that. Yeah. But if we're down to, you're picking a topic. Now, it's not just for me. But for, you know, what are we going to teach? You're in charge of the new year's curriculum for the teens and adults in your congregation. Right? And I say, we want some of them to be topical. We don't want just, you know, this was about, this was about. But by the time you go to topical, you've almost used the word doctor. Right? So, would you have included a, a lesson on justice, or kindness, or the humble walk with God? Or do you spend all your time on Christology or soteriology or harmatology or some otherology. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I think that we need a good balance. And I think that uh, some people on the outside have accused, in broad sweeping terms, Christians of being more concerned about technicalities of doctrine and correctness of, of what is true where uh, Muslims are more concerned about right behavior. And they say, well, they're going to interpret it differently. They're not too hung up on that. And you can also see among different groups claiming to follow Christ, there are different emphases. I don't think we have to become the, what we used to call the liberal church that doesn't care about doctrine and whether Jesus is really the Son of God, to say we need more emphasis on justice and kindness and humility. And to me, we have trouble with the word doctrine 
because it just needs teaching. And we need to teach those as well as we do the correct interpretation of who Jesus is, what the response is for salvation, what the Holy Spirit does. These are all very interesting topics and important. They really are important. But I think sometimes Jesus will come back to us and say, Y'all are still working out the five points of the Holy Spirit. I'm not a kind person in your congregation. You think maybe there's a more important subject here? You see what I'm saying? As we look for doctrine, we need to look at what kind of people we should put. Remember that passage in Peter? Considering everything's going to be taken away in the end and the world's going to burn up, what sort of people are we to be? That's a doctrine also. What sort of people are we to be? You know, like Oprah was interviewing a, a gal on her show, and he said that he had studied the New Testament, he had studied the Grand Gospel. And he said when he went to church, he didn't see that person in the church. And you know what Gandhi said about you? He said he didn't see that person. Gandhi said, I love your Christ, I'm not so impressed with your Christian. Yeah. <laughs> and they would have been correct on doctrine, the way they used to define doctrine. But you know, when you look at Daniel, when you look at Daniel, he loved God and he was so until his God. And so you can make an argument that he had to be love, you know, he had to love uh, never connected. You know, being the egomatic and, and all that stuff that he never was. Because when he goes to him to tell him about that second dream he had, that, you know, God's going to punish him and turn you to a cop, he, he said, I wish somebody was other than you. You know, he, he's really, but he was so caught up in his God. He, he loved well, God. I'll tell you what God said. Okay. He showed, but he was able to show mercy to, you know, never to have And I think that is good. We need to keep reading that. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, these are the major three plans. And uh, I want you to look at what the doctrinal options are. You're free to have other opinions on this, as y'all don't necessarily have to take these three minutes. But I think it would be helpful to us, you know, part of this course is for us to gather from graduating students how can we handle our program in the future. All right? In the new course rotation, it is on the right, on the left is what doctoral courses are now required. The only one that is required is biblical interpretation. And then depending on whether it's text or ministry or youth ministry, you have eight or seven general electives, which can be basically the activity or Christian ethics. Now, you're also required to take textual courses, but that's not the subject here. Um, what are the chances that a new young Bible major is going to choose the ones who are on the list of doctrinal courses? These are the ones we're going to teach them about. What can they choose? Notice that Christian ethics is taught every time. It's going to be required of non majors and majors. No, it's going to be required of non majors. Majors and majors. Biblical interpretation is required, so that's off the list. So now what's left? Other religions. And evidence. That's good, isn't it? Wow. And stretch, isn't it? You could, you could come to me on a day that I want to think about this and say, let's talk about Dr. and I say, let's talk about We're kind of dry stuff here. But when I look at that, I think, what happened to doctrine? Do you think it's going to make its way into the life of Christ and finish you? Kings and prophets. Hmm. I, I see concerned faces. Do you have any thoughts or just the people? If it had been heavily weighted with doctrinal forces, I'd say you're just indoctrinated. You're preaching your brand of Christianity. On the other hand, if there is no course on Christology, but the life of Christ could be there. There is no course on pneumatology, but Acts, and this is not going to do that. 
But some of the subjects are just not going to be addressed. Uh, inspiration scripture, uh, the nature of the church. You see, it's not even being offered. We have to cover that in Acts, right? But we didn't learn anything about the church in the epistle. I mean, I agree that. <laughs> so, give that some thought, maybe get back to the next time. Uh, no, I'm not here to criticize the plan. But, uh, Tom Brennan is the best administrator I've ever heard. And he, he put together a good structure. He really had it. And I didn't bring it today, but I want you someday to see what the non major was going to say. It's going to be different. And maybe some of that needs to be pulled into the majors program. But now that I've got you thinking about doctrine, and you're supposed to, you know, you're going to funnel this into what kind of doctrine would you do a lesson on? Um, I already asked you, some textual courses did, did doctrinal things, right? Did your church history, by the way, did anybody take more than one church history course? Yes. Oh, y'all in the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did they deal with doctrinal things? Well, the first people with church history did. Oh! Yeah. yeah maybe because we came to the Catholic Church, maybe, wasn't it? The medieval church. Yeah, the Paul and, and the church fathers. Yeah, the church fathers. Yeah. Yeah. So like if they were talking about like... Transubstantiation. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you did talk about some historical doctrines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about in that uh, Restoration Movement in America? Did you talk oh, yeah. about doctrines that yeah. seem to be unique to churches of Christ yeah. and similar churches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can talk about some doctrines and those. Mm -hmm. And they talked about changing it to not just history of the history and philosophy. Yeah, of the right. But that was so many of those. You were just catching them. You didn't really just. Mm -hmm. like, you are sure to get it, and by the way, I'm right. <laughs> okay? Now, not everyone has to take practical courses. We teach a lot of impractical courses out there. But uh, any ministry type courses whether it was youth ministry or the work of the preacher or something like that. Did any of those deal with doctrinal perceptions? No? Not right. You didn't necessarily have a lot of Bible. And that, there's a place for that. I think a lot of people graduate and boy, I wish I'd had more how to be a minister instead of just being able to tell what Daniel stuff. <laughs> uh, what is some of them that everybody has to say? So far, there was languages. Is everybody happy about that? I'm not happy about that. It depends on the language. I'm personally not happy about Hebrew. But you know, the new ones, you don't take a textual track and take Spanish. Yes. <laughs> the thing is, with Hebrew, and uh, I don't know where it is, but um, I think Hebrew is too, it's, it's too fast thing. I think they need to break it down so we can really understand the language, you know, and it's like you move so fast that you, you're not really grasping what you really want to learn. Like, I want to learn Hebrew, yeah. you know, but it's going so fast you can't catch up. And, you know, it seems like the day to step when you take the class, it's like it's leaning more for you dropping it because you don't want to fail it. Sure. Say, I don't mind. I was somebody going to tell you. Say, it, will, yeah. it would be good to, if it's been offered in the fall, if those people that, that you know, going to take it in the fall, like you know, if they know in April, so they can go ahead and buy it. Learn some of the words, and then if you instead of walking in that very first day, it's almost like some of high school college, and you, I mean, you just not ready. Exactly. We are making one improvement. Not where we asked for, but we're moving in the right direction. You know that next year they're going to some places meet Monday and Wednesday Friday. Mm -hmm. Well, the languages are definitely going to meet Monday and Wednesday Friday. We thought they should be four days away. Uh, really, because there's only so much memorizing you can do. And if you've got to go from Wednesday to the next Monday without being in class, you better be a disciplined person. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a chance between you and say and Monday, you might get in so that you don't know which way to turn. And the teacher's not there to ask. I mean, you can bother them on the way. You know, I'm thinking the guys on the YouTube, the rabbis on the on the on the on YouTube, they teach it instead. Instead of just maybe saying this word, this word, and how this how you pronounce it, the guy's family, he's giving you the history behind the word, he's telling you kind of how it fits in with the language and all that, and you can kind of remember some of that, you know, you can remember it instead of just... So really the languages are a tool you would love to have. Yeah. I mean, and you really could then, sure. for instance, um, you could dig into whether the word baptizo is immersion. First of all, is it part of the actual definition? Mm -hmm. Second, is there New Testament teaching that builds on that idea of immersion? And there is. You wouldn't want to take either one by itself. But if you know that this is significant, but if you find out that and means and, you haven't really accomplished it. <laughs> yeah. well, I can the thing here of Mr. Haker. Yeah, it makes you kind of want to learn because we got a guy in our five story preaching class, and he, you know, he understands the Greek real well, and he gives you the intent. He, he tells you the intent of the writer behind the words, and it, and it makes it makes the parable it makes it make sense. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so you kind of want to learn that. Exactly. One thing, I, not that you don't want to learn. One thing I'd like for us to look at doing, and this is in the long term future, but. Come up with a real training for people who are not going to choose to actually be able to read for Teach them how to look up some Greek words in books that are mostly in English, but it's alphabetized in Greek or using the Greek characters. Because in that book, you need to learn the alphabet. Yeah. You know to do a good alphabet. And that's, that's something that got me thinking about. It. But yeah. you can read books and tell you that you need to learn the alphabet. Yeah. Just so you can look up some words. Yeah, if you look up some words. Yeah. Yeah. Tells you how to open up and keep reading those things. <laughs> okay. Now, we just went over this. The content was how to interpret, and if they threw out some examples of doctrines, it was just about how to interpret. Does that sound like the way they handled it? I've never taken it there, so I don't know. All right, and we talked about the principles. Now, do you think that would apply to some specific doctrines, such as? We're saved by grace through faith. He who has the faith of Christ. Can you see those things use an interpretation? Or could be taken more than one way? Or um, are putting together Romans and James on faith and works? You have to come up with some interpretation without just trying to explain either one away. Okay, now in the great doctrines of the Bible, just Keep your minds and go back to it. If you were teaching textual courses, what are some places where you would really want to emphasize theology proper of the nature of God? What are some books where you could really develop that thing? Probably not so much by Genesis. Genesis for sure. Genesis. Much of the song, but from a very different angle. I think a lot of the prophets, the poetic descriptions of God, Isaiah, and even Revelation, particularly the visions of God, I think Isaiah's vision of God and, and the vision and the visions in Revelation, there's something about God that we can only describe in figurative terms. You know, doing the lectures, we last year. I was sitting Dr. Hampton class. He taught on, on, on Providence. Mm -hmm. And all my life I heard in Habakkuk mm -hmm. thought one way. Right. You know, Habakkuk stood up on the mountain. I was stood up on the wall and he waited on God, waited on God. Dr. Hampton said, wait a minute. God already knew. He was, you know, he said he made it simple. Something that we already knew. He God knows everything. So he already knew and he had already put some things and he just showed Habakkuk what he was already doing. <laughs> he said, he's already doing this. And, you know, and, and he started pointing out, you know, but Habakkuk was so caught up in, in all the circumstances around him, he didn't see the things that God was already doing. And so he had any interpreted. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the doctrine. Yeah. There is a doctrine yeah. of God. Yeah. 
And I'm just, just looking at this little piece of yeah. her, she don't put that. And what he was saying, and I started looking at it. I said, dog, you know, that's my life. You know, that's my life. I'm so, I get so caught up in stuff going around me, and I don't, you know, I forget the things that God's already doing. Thank you for mentioning the lecture. By the way, the subject this year is God is. There's theology. By the way, I'm required to tell you that you are required to attend Marketplace Faith 8.30 to 11.30 in Leicester Chapel this Friday. It is homecoming and they're bringing in some alumni to talk about something. Well, come on, it's Oh, uh, no, no. I, I was saying, of course you want to teach Christ from the gospel. What things about the nature of Christ would you pull out of the epistle? Hebrews, for example. And about the high priest. You don't really get a lot of that in the gospel. Yeah. Yes. He is our intercessor. I know that the Holy Spirit intercedes, but Christ is our intercessor. He is our advocate. Uh, he is still active in the book of Revelation, although it's real hard to say what's what. But still, he still is going to be going to bring you all together. Yeah. He's speaking to us now. There is a lot about Christ in heaven, reigning with God, that is revealed beyond the gospel. I think we do need to be careful when we go to the Old Testament to teach about Christ. One of my favorite teachers said that he hesitated to ever say that something was a prophecy of Christ unless the New Testament took it. Now, I think there are plenty of allusions to Christ. Every time that Israel's going to get a good leader or be rescued, there are allusions to Christ. So to say for sure this is a prophecy of Christ, there are enough of them named in the New Testament in the Old Testament. Well, you can teach Christ from the Old Testament, but I think it takes a little more care. All right, where would you go to teach about the Holy Spirit? Which classes should teach about that? How about historical classes? The Book of Acts, okay. But well, were there some things that were unique to the Book of Acts that are kind of hard to stretch to today? If you take the interpretation that uh, the tongues that were given on the day of Pentecost were the languages of those regions that were mentioned, that's my knowledge. There aren't many missionary groups that are saying God's going to do that for them. So there are things that are unique there. You have God reaching out to Cornelius and to the Ethiopian in kind of two different ways. So how much do you have there about God? Neither of those says the Spirit did something, although with the Ethiopian it says the Spirit spoke to Philip, the evangelist. So yeah, there's places for that, but again, you have to also go to the Epistle. <laughs> so that's why, I think that's why we classify some things as God. There's no one book of the Bible that makes clear the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so you won't get it just if, if you're only doing textual studies, which are always my preference to do textual studies. But we need to deal with the fact that if there's something that's mentioned in many different places, you're not going to get the whole picture if you study in just one place. Um, sin and salvation. Now, sin, I go back to Genesis. Of course. But what about uh, David's life? Well, that's an Old Testament would you do for sin. The prophet can be very harsh about sin. Um, and salvation. That's why you can talk about both. You know, sin and you can talk about God's grace. And Almost every book in the New Testament you can talk about something. Depending on how you can talk. And you get different perspectives on it. Alright. Now the church. All my life I have spoken of the New Testament church. 
and we want to be like the New Testament church. Which one? In Corinth? Laodicea? <laughs> um, I think that we all believe, but probably all, I mean, every one of us has a different perspective. We all believe that there is the ideal church represented in the big picture of many healthy congregations. And then there are the broader teachings about church when you're speaking of the church. It's not talking about a congregation. And yet, you read about the church which he purchased with his blood. It's not insignificant. And yet, as people don't want to identify with a particular group, as the nuns are becoming the number one religion, church is about to disappear. Well, I think a refreshing study of the doctrine of church would be, would be good. Now, in the new rotation, can we go back again? I just wonder if people are going to choose it like this because I look at some of these broader things. And more to the point for us in this room, as we move on in life, are we going to say, yeah, I studied Dr. Mack in college, or are we going to keep studying the subjects? We're we going to try to broaden our understanding and how much of it is our deeply rooted tradition and how much of it is, yeah, we've always done it that way, but you know what? That's not in the Bible. And I think I mentioned this before. I, I've come to believe there are useful traditions that are just traditions. There are counterproductive traditions that are just traditions. You make the decision. Of the then there are traditions that are scriptural traditions. And then I don't. And that's what we need to sort out. I'm going to ask you to um, look at some things. I'm going to give you an assignment. Or you're going to look at some websites and surveys. What are people concerned about? What doctrines, what teachings are they concerned about? I hope that along the way, and we may only be able to touch the human government on this, that you look at some popular and scholarly journals to see what doctrines are people talking about today. Well, let's start with the easiest one. I saw the list of, uh, I don't know if you know, but for the QC chapels, the students were asked to submit questions. And I saw the list, and uh, I said, I'd do crazy for them down there, listen on that. But Brother Mason did that. He's going to do better than I would by far. But uh, one was, and I know exactly where it came from, what if you baptize someone and not don't go completely underwater? Uh, I think you should get it from the others. So then a few times I'll watch you. Should. I was so concerned about one. All, all the time I remember baptizing the same person for There was this very large woman who was nine months back in the Her husband was larger than she was. He was seven foot two and big. Wow. And she. And so I said, you know. We're probably not going to visit the public baptism, considering the delicacy of the situation. And they would. So, first, when they went there, I let some of the water out of the baptistry. And I invited the husband to help them because he kind of down them just now. Yeah. Pregnant belly under the water. So, I let a little more water out. And we were very careful because we wanted to baptize the way we believe people baptize. I'm pretty sure we got a hundred words. Later, so you know, that, well over ten years later, I baptized the baby. Not that he was old enough to make his own decisions. He my baby anymore. But uh, yes, I would want to do it that way. I don't even believe there is one formula that you must say when you baptize. But I think you should, if it's a solemn and happy occasion, and then you need to say something appropriate. But is that what people can say? Is that, is that the deepest doctrine, whether they got all the way under or not? 
What doctrines? Does anybody talking about doctrines? What doctrines do they talk about? Christ. Is there any disagreement? Well, or the Jehovah's Witnesses come talk to you about the nature of Christ. When he's a man, when he's God, when he's found, when he's divine. Some people don't believe that he was human because they believe our human is essential. What's your devotion in marriage? One time, I was being considered to preach in Auburn, Alabama. All the church I remember very well. I kept the a lot. After the evening service, they invited the congregation to kind of a fellowship. But first, they took me down in the middle of a circular group of whoever or whatever to ask me what I believe. And you better believe they asked what I thought about who can read their hands for the voice. I felt like I was in good company. Didn't they try to trust Jesus that way? Mm-hmm. But I didn't was not. Because you're going to offend someone or you're going to compromise what you believe. So, yeah, you can talk about that. It's an important doctrine, isn't it? And whether you get the specifics down or not, you can't deny that dedication to St. Mary is not what it used to be. And we all know that's what Jesus wanted. He would be dedicated to St. Mary. What other things do we want? about? Are they totally uninterested in doctrine? We talk about the authority of the preacher or the elder or the board, the role of women in the church. Mm-hmm. The role of women. I mean, it, it, it was already a popular thing. more and more important. Church and politics? Yes. Okay. Church and social movements? They are Alcohol and drug and opioids that he people know that is. Or how this church is better than all the other churches. Like this is the church. I think a lot of churches deal with that. Um, you know, just like the Church of Christ, they might say, you know, this is the church in the Bible. You know, all the other churches that don't preach this type of doctrine, this that's not the right church. Oh, the only no, no, not all that to say is it's a lot of all of them just about, you know, basically trying to spend most of their time trying to tell you that this is the right place to be and everybody else is wrong. I remember when we built a new building in Augusta, Georgia. Next door to us was a small Covenant Baptist congregation. They were kind enough to this one. They were praying for us and they hoped we could do what they wanted. And they were literally, the next block behind was a bigger Southern Baptist church. It was literally in the shadow. And there, there's some primitive Baptists who are so firm in some of their beliefs they don't want to be part of Southern Baptist Church. And whether they say we're right or you're wrong, it's no way to get around. They believe that, or they wouldn't have separated. Right? So there is that. And then there's the idea well, are you in a church you don't believe is right? There's another way of looking at the same thing. Uh, and then I think we're going to deal much more than we want to with uh, whether. You can act on same sex attraction and still be accepted as a Christian. That's going to be bad. For, for the generation after I'm gone, it's going to be a good thing. If you act on your same sex attraction, does that exclude you as a faith in your It is. And do you know which is the popular opinion, in, at least on television and in the movies? No doubt it's so. You know, but I think it's, 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 one, it's one position. It's like I worked at rooms ago. I, I saw friends at rooms. And, and they, you know, they made it known that, you know, that was, that everybody walked through that door was rooms ago. And you were supposed to treat them all the same. Yeah. You were supposed to treat them all the same. So, I mean, you know, to me, a man should like a woman. And, you know, you got these two, you know, a couple of two, two men, 250 pound uh, men, and, and they're telling you, you know, hey, we are idle. Mm-hmm. One of them says to the other one, you know, I'm going to buy the back one. So I'm going to pick the master. 
And, and you know, I, I mean, as a business person, how do you? I mean, and, and you can't show that you. I mean, you can't show any negative because you know, guy goes to the email address and sends it out, and he goes straight up to the president. So, I mean, you, you know, there were a couple times I gritted my teeth and I walked away. To the point that I made, but I'll be right. I'll be. I'll be getting back in a minute. Go and review and come back. You know, and put on that face. And I told him, but but um, that's room to go. But now when it comes to yeah, it comes to the church. That's different. Then. That's different. Because I don't think that we would say that a man can act on his opposite sex attraction any way he wants to and be counted as a faithful Christian. Everybody's got to exercise control. So I'm going to give you some websites. You've got some assignments coming up. Now, back back to Jesus for a minute, and then I think I want to go down to the computer lab and, and let you hear some things out there. Um, besides that biblical interpretation, how about your sermon preparation classes? Did they talk about extra Jesus? Were you required to do extra Jesus for the sermon preparation class? No, no, not the kind that we had a piece for. Nothing like the one you gave us the other day. But that's just to keep you humble and think and all the things. I want you to do enough. I want you to feel for the rest of your life. Every time you draw on the left. All right, I've got you going pretty much from midterm. Do you need more than that to do a good full execution? Think about this for the next couple of weeks. You know. And this is a broader question. In your heart of hearts, how much do you think exegesis is a really serious kind of exegesis? Is going to figure in your ongoing ministry for years to come? Is any part of you think, I'm not going to get around to that? You wouldn't get it. <laughs> As someone who is looking to go into children's ministry, I think they will play the rest of a role in some maybe a pulpit or something like that. I think they're only going to be able to support it. To the extent you can apply to lessons you are preparing, but also in a continuing study. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, I think, as a preventative of just swallowing the next thing that comes down the line in somebody's magazine. Okay, you have assignments that I want to go over with you. Is that the black one? Yes. Okay, now over here, when you go to the one that it opens up, I've kind of beefed up the blackboard for you. He doesn't want to go there, does it? Okay. I've added a place that just lists assignments because it, you have to scroll down forever to get to your assignments. And you can actually go to a page that's over here that's separate for assignments. There's much more instruction there. But if you start on one, you want to just come back to it, you can do them here. Now let me show you what I have for this unit. If we go to the unit to assignments. And we're going to go downstairs to see if there are any tools there that will help you. All right, this one has been a I don't know if you've all done it or not. Well, all of these are theology. Um, here's the list of theological subjects. How many of them are the most important? And that went together with these two, where you were to make a list of off the top of your head and then have to follow. What are essential doctrines? I hope that you'll revise that list the rest of your life. But I think we all need to make a list. Because none of us get everything we want to do or think. So we have to choose which ones. And I thought, I really thought this was helpful. Those were, we, they, you know, maybe they should be on top of my list if everybody's got it on their list. Now, here's a new one where I'm now going to try to group your discussion boards into the unit. So, go to Doctrine. These are all listed as discussion boards because I want you to interact with each other on them. But here's one that I intended to do before, but I kept working on it and tweaking it. And it's kind of a long assignment. I want you to run have this a week from today. 
All right, I went through with a great word search for the Vigasa Leaf. And if you'll notice, look how many are in Timothy and Titus of all the passages that use that word. And there are other forms of it. Uh, like here, this was hetero the gospel out, those who teach another gospel. But it calls it the teaching instruction, but in, say, the King James Version, these were for almost all big doctrines. I want you to go through and read them all in English, but I want you to read them in more than one version if, if it's not clear. And then I want you to do a, a search on any computer component that you can find for the word doctrine to see if it's not on this list meaning that uh, some other word means doctrine. And you're just to get what is the meaning and significance of doctrine in the New Testament. That's the main question. But I want you to have something to back it up and then interact with one another on that. And that's one of your assignments. Uh, I wonder if we can go back for you. Yes. The other long one I'm coming back to me. this one is simple I want it done by next class to what extent do churches shape doctrine according to the principles of those two I talked about to what extent should they why are some student uh, subjects what are some subjects that you can teach in the church on that? and that one's it's, it says so in the instructions, but that one is for next time. And one other short one is doctrine in the curriculum. I should go back over the slides that we went over and come up with a, a general uh, recommendation to the powers that be for the future. They should ever dig into the archives. You know, as I looked at that and I thought about it a while, you might want to think, are you sure it's going to include this or uh, you know, it's really good. Uh, there was so much on doctrine before, and now you just need to teach it. I want your opinion, and then I want you to find someone who had something in addition to or contrary to what you thought and interact with one another. That shouldn't be the law. Now, the other one is going to require work and thinking. Because this is uh, you have 80, 80, 160 minutes, so uh, you need to be spending 320 minutes a week outside class, just to meet the government standard. Doctrine for the man. I want you to work on this when we go down to um, computer lab, but I'll, one other thing I'll make for Jesus on it while we're down there. Right, these are sites of religion surveys, of some reputable surveys. And you have three questions. Once you've Give them all, go back and pick some specifics to answer. Uh, what doctrines seem to concern most people? What doctrines seem to divide people? And how would you incorporate the neglected popular doctrinal concerns in lessons or divisive? How would you incorporate them in lessons? Now, you can pull this up in a minute and pull them, and uh, you know, we can go downstairs. But um, Gallup has them broken down this way. Now, Gallup is not particularly looking for religion, but it is one thing they cover. And theirs will be on a much more popular level. But they break it down into um, religion and social trends, uh, society and religion, kind of same thing. Religion and politics, religion and ethics. And basically, they're trying to find out does people's religion make a difference in their ethics or their politics. So you can look at that. Uh, the Pew Religious Landscape Study is very, very broad. So much just how many people are more than kind of thing. But some of it is what do people believe and what are people concerned about. So you're going to have to kind of, I want you to get your feet wet in what's available out there and then use some discernment to know what's significant in there. Uh, this is the uh, Public Religion Research Institute. It may not be easily accessible to you. Some of it's just spreadsheets of data, but it is a prime. It is a good source. Now, 
I looked several times. I had trouble finding. Baylor has produced something called The Values and Beliefs of the American Public. Now, they published the book, and they mostly want you to buy the book on Amazon. But I did find one site that published some of their findings. These are all in the, you know, the 2000s. And then, uh, finally, the ARDA is the Association of Religion Data Archives. And they have linked to many, many, many surveys. So the point of this exercise, first when you go downstairs, when you find all this stuff, then how would you wade through it to see what are people concerned about and not concerned about? What are they divided on? It may not be the issues we're interested in at all, particularly doubt. And that doesn't mean that's what you're going to teach on. But how can we not just choose? First, we're going to choose what's important in the Bible. We all know that. Second, what are people talking about? What, what are people's concerns? What are the subjects? And I'm almost, not there, but I'm almost ready to say doctrine and subjects is almost the same thing. Now, you know, you can do a topical lesson or a textual lesson. Well, topical, if it's a topic and it comes from various places in the Bible, it's doctrine. Now, the other thing I want you to do is pull up the logo stand there and see if you can find Nestor's critical commentary. And your passage that you're doing next to Jesus, what it says about it. Um, the catalog said we had a copy in the curly one, but it should not sit on the shelf where it's supposed to. I'm talking to the library, and if you have the actual source of it. There's a copy of it in there, so I'm going to go down with you, and just pull up the blackboard and start looking at these signs in this assignment, just to kind of see what the landscape is. You're doing your survey of what you're going to study later. And also, find the Logos program down there and see all the resources that are there. I, I want you to, to immerse yourself into what's available. And in particular, your assignment is to find Metzger's critical commentary. You know all that? What's that word? Metzger? M-E-T-Z-G-E-R. What is the other guy? You already got what? You already got our computer in front of us, so you still have to. Well, do you have logo summons? Yeah. I know. But I'm just going to use it to look for this. But it says Blackboard, isn't it? Yeah, but Metzger's not. Oh, okay. So I want you to, I want you to go down there and use uh, Find Metzger. Okay. And I want to show you what's there. There's also another program I forgot the name of it. There's also things for learning the original language. So I want you to so bring your computer and you can use your own book there. Let's go see what's down there. And Gary, you come and I'll give you a personal tour. Let me give you the chart. Logos is the program.